By the way, Buck, you asked um, what I thought the impact of RFK Jr. could be. I think the biggest impact could be that he ensures that the COVID failures remain paramount as we move into the 2024 elections. And ultimately, and this is kind of a funny thing, I think he could inoculate, dad joke there, I don't know, inoculate Trump if Trump were to pick him on what I think is one of the weakest parts of Trump's 2024 campaign so far, which is arguing that the COVID shot is some huge scientific victory and that he is very proud that it happened. I think that could play poorly in the Republican primary when it actually ends up as a point of debate. And we'll talk about this with Tucker, who is making news about this already. But that would be my theory. I also think it makes it hard for the media, harder for the media to claim, oh, this is just a stupid right-wing anti-science thing when RFK Jr. is like, no, actually, the COVID shot is not the success story that everybody's claiming. So I will I will lay out my bias here on this just because I, I think I for me, COVID should have been a single issue voter issue for everybody in the entire country. I, I yep. honestly feel that to the point where, you know, even on the book I'm working on now, you know, you know what I've early uh, early stuff I'm dealing with is like a little less a little less fury about some of the COVID stuff. But you know, I'm like, all right, all right. You know, some of the people I'm having to, you know, read some of my early drafting and I sit here and I'm like, look. I don't understand how people don't realize how close we came to no longer living in a free society. Full stop. Yeah. And we, we weren't living in a free society for a while. People don't want to hear it. I mean, this is the, the, the challenge that I have is w- w- you're saying this and I want to agree with you because yeah. I agree in principle that that should be how it lines up. But I think a lot of people uh, at this point, they just want to think about other things and they don't and they want they're worried about. Look, and I, I'm not putting down these worries. They're real worries, but you know, they're worried about inflation and they're they're concerned about, uh, you know, illegal immigration and they're concerned about fentanyl and drugs in the streets and everything else. And covid, uh, you know, I just, you know, I, I want to believe, but I haven't I haven't seen it. Who who lost their job in politics over covid in a meaningful way so far it you're has, right the only one the only one that i know this is this is the ultimate the irony of was, it was for grabbing ladies and like smooching their uh smooching their Correct. cheeks and stuff the right? only, it wasn't... Th- this is what's crazy everybody's furious 2022 election only one statewide office holder republican or democrat who ran for re-election as an incumbent lost only one Governor Steve Sistelak, and I might have just messed up his name, Democrat governor of Nevada, lost to Joe Lombardo. Only one incumbent lost. That's not a, you know, that he's not, that wasn't Gretchen Whitmer, you know, right. it wasn't Gavin Newsom. Gavin Newsom won in recall, everybody. You know, we, we, we just have to look at what, you know, what the system, I knew a, a, a hedge fund guy used to talk about what he called repeat surprise. And it's where you learn things and then you convince yourself that things you learned aren't true and then you make the same mistake again. Common in finance, common in a whole lot of things. I think that the indicators we've had are that I think that there's a portion of the American population that's not just very fired up over COVID. They're very fired up or fired up over vaccines and the FDA in general. Um, this has existed on the right and actually on the left. It's one of those things where you have the anti-vaccine, not just COVID vaccine, anti-vaccine criticism. And it's tough because they're not saying no vaccines. They're talking about greater vaccine safety. So the terminology can be imprecise here. And I understand that. But you have kids that are, you know, their parents work at Google and live in Palo Alto. They don't want to get vaccines. And you have people who are very anti-government and live in rural areas and don't trust the FDA. They don't want to get vaccines. So I think RFK Jr. is tapping into that, which is its own thing. It's a little bit even, it's part COVID, but it's something else too. And I just don't know if that lasts as people, you got to remember the Biden, we haven't even seen what the Biden campaign is right now. The full scale propaganda. I think a lot of it is going to be, it's going to be January 6th videos all the time. I get what it. What do you think CNN's plan? You know what I mean? We're, so we're going to be saying, hey, what about like COVID vaccines that didn't work so well, right? This and is- This is where the anti-establishment thing to me comes in so much, Buck. You know what Steve Jobs said when people asked him when he was making the iPhone or when he was making the iPad? They said, hey, we're doing a lot of market research. People say they don't want this. 
Steve, and I'm paraphrasing, Steve Jobs said, it's my job to let them know why they should want it. And I think we have so many politicians today who sit around and look at the polling and try to chase the wave as opposed to setting the wave themselves. And that, to me, is one of the great flaws, right? They're chasing where the audience is. Another good analogy here uh, from Sportsbook. I love it. I try to teach my kids it all the time. They asked Wayne Gretzky, how do you score so many goals? Uh, for I'm not a huge hockey guy, but all your hockey fans out there are like, yes. And, and the answer was, he said, I don't skate where the puck is. I skate where the puck is going. I feel like so many of our politicians are a year or 18 months or two years behind because it takes that long for the polling to work its way through. And I, I just, to your point, Buck, I don't know. I mean, DeSantis won by almost 20 points. And if I were talking to the DeSantis campaign, I would say, why did you win by almost 20 points in Florida? Because you were right. But you got the wave years after you were right. Does that make sense? This is a perfect example, though, right? I mean, based on what we've seen so far, it, it was consolidated in Florida. People recognized how right he was. Do people in Michigan care? Do people in Arizona care? Do you know what I mean? This this is the and and uh, you know I, I think you're looking at in the case of of DeSantis the single and and look the the Trump campaign is attacking him saying he wasn't good on COVID. And I get people it. are writing people are writing to us saying no there that that's true he wasn't good on COVID. So nothing is but but what I'm nothing getting is at established is, nothing is clear yet. I, I think that's true, but you don't hit the if you are chasing a wave. Think about it from a surfing perspective. And I've tried to surf and I suck at it. And there's really probably hard. people out there. Yeah, I tried. Yeah, I it's suck very too. difficult. Yeah. There's people out there in California who are going to be way better at this. But if you try to chase an existing wave, you never take off because the wave has already passed you. If you wait and, and put yourself in position and work on paddling and everything else, you can ride that wave and you, and you take off. And so I think that nobody's making the case. I think that there are a lot of Republicans running right now who are worried about appealing to the establishment because that's where you go get the money, right? If you're super successful, you don't actually want that much to get rattled. If you're cutting a check for $100,000 to somebody, you're, you want them to be stable. There's a disconnect, I think, between the donor class and the people out there who are fed up with the direction of the country, and so far those aren't connecting. So you can raise $100 million, but if you're out there selling what the donor class likes, you aren't connecting with the base. And that is where the Trump rallies are so intuitive and why Trump, I think, has had such a good connection because he's never really been a donor class guy. He's been a base guy. It's interesting also, I do think you could make a very, and I'll make the case because it's quick and it's easy, that Trump's biggest victories of policy, not of messaging and movement building, but his biggest victories of policy came from using the system as it is, but making the right decisions within, as in excellent judges on the Supreme Court, yep. massive legacy there, right? He didn't say, we're going to put 30 judge justices, you know, he didn't, he didn't try to change everything. He didn't, you know, if you're talking about truly being anti-establishment in policy, um, people talk about the great Trump economy. He did tax cuts, Paul Ryan style tax cuts, if we're yep. going to be honest about it. Um, and that and it worked and it was good. I mean, again, Arthur these, these Laffer, are, who we've this had is on, praise. genius, genius. Right. This, this is yeah. this is not. But I'm just saying the the like tear down the system thing. People talk about this, but what was really torn down then? What would really be torn down now? I would also even argue that uh, the better immigration, uh, the better immigration policies, building a wall. It's kind of funny. They, building a wall relies on the system to get it built but is anti the system in terms of the pol the politics of it, right? But you need to obviously have a machinery behind you to build the the total mileage of of upgraded wall, et cetera, that he had. And and I think you could argue that enforcing the law is in some way now an anti-establishment position, certainly when it comes to immigration. So I'm just, there's complexities here. There's some, you know what I mean? There's, the, it's, it's, what does it mean to be a former president who's anti-establishment, but who's racked up some wins using the establishment, right? That's what you see with Trump. And with RFK Jr., he's anti-establishment, but if he's not a Kennedy, are we even talking about him? Do we even know about him? 
there, there's no doubt. I mean, look, if, if Trump doesn't inherit uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from his father, do we talk about him? Look, I, I'm just uh, yeah. I'm I mean, there's a lot to... of guys. There's a lot of guys who get into politics. Let's be honest, and girls that are born born on third base. So but a lot of people have a lot, have a lot of, of a lot of people have yeah. a lot of money, and you know, don't beat Hillary Clinton when 99 percent of the media, etc., are aligned with you know. It, the money is look. It's it's helpful to have money in life. There's no question. I mean, the RFK Jr. thing is that's well, what that's I would being say, built right into politics, right? I mean, totally. I, but if you're John F. Kennedy or Robert F. Kennedy's sons, how many of those guys have zero balls? By which I mean, it's a pretty good life, right? People fet you because of who your dad was. You are rich, and Teddy people like you. The, the, the lion of the Senate, let's not forget, which was grotesque. But anyway, Teddy Kennedy was a big deal for a long time. But, too. but I mean, it, what I'm getting at, and I think Trump ties in here, too. There's lots of billionaires. Most billionaires don't have actual balls, right? In terms of being willing to put themselves out there on the front lines and take slings and arrows for what they do. Remember, if Trump had never run for president, he would still be getting his name dropped in every rap song. He would still be able to show up at every golf event and people no, would I, I, across the I, board Trump love him, was right? an anti-establishment candidate. There's no question about it. I'm just saying, what is an anti-establishment candidate now who's a former president and the no, front runner? No, I think it's a and, challenge. You know, you know, it's a different thing, right? It's a di- the, the I'm going to come in and smash up the system this time. You know, it has to be a continuation of the first term. That's just yeah. baked into all of this. Um, and, and you're looking at, other than Trump and RFK Jr., is there anybody who feels like they're operating outside of the established political? And, and I think this is your fundamental point, yeah. just to bring us. Is there anyone who's operating out? You know, there isn't some out. There's not a Ross Perot. There's not an outsider candidate beyond that in either side of things, uh, even even looking at um, lesser candidates in terms of the polls. So I just I feel like I sit here, though, and I I think that we will look back on the conversations we're having now about the 2024 election in January and February and be like, wow, nobody could have seen how that was going to play. I mean, we've got we got a president facing multiple federal indi- or multiple indictments, one federal. We got, you know, uh, we got a million. You know, who knows where the economy is going to be? Is Russia going to you know, invade Poland? We got a million things that could happen. So the dynamics now are interesting. But I just I from my mindset, urge a little a little caution. I'll give you one right now. Be. If we had been talking in at Christmas and I had told you that Trump was going to have opened up a 25 or 30 point lead as we come up on totally. mid July, that would have seemed highly unlikely sitting in Christmas, right? Does, does anyone ago. even remember now that at one point Ron DeSantis was within single digits of Donald Trump in the polls? Does anyone even remember that? Cause that happened. Yeah. You know, and now it feels like, Oh, well that was, you know, didn't, you know, that's folks. That's why it's fun to roll here with us. Cause uh, it's a dynamic business we're in.